Um, okay, so I've kept it really light and, uh, and, and basic. We're in a double deep recession. It's Wednesday. Uh, we're all tired, so I thought I'm gonna, I was going to start with something really basic and introductory. So, uh, but it's also something that we don't seem to be uh, discussing a lot in the industry. Um, I'll just a caveat, if something uh, kind of like doesn't come through with my Tony Soprano accent, just stop me and ask me, and I will repeat it. If you don't get it, I will repeat it again. If you don't get it again, I will shoot you. <laughs> so it's something that we don't discuss um, enough, which is the reasons why we are in the data visualization business. And uh, data visualization has become now the main interface for dealing with most of the information that we uh, collect, fetch, store, process, analyze. Uh, and, and, and data visualization is also becoming one of the main costs of the businesses that we run and the services that we buy. And working in an agency, as you, as you know, agencies are a bit of a sweatshop, so you need to justify every single action and every single bit of cost and hours and resources that goes into something. So justifying spending on visualizing data has been uh, quite key to us in terms of providing our services and getting people to buy our services. And visualizing data is one of the things that we do because we do a lot of social data uh, and mobile data analytics. But let's get straight into what this is about. So I went back and looked a little bit at what, uh, where this is coming from. And, and obviously, there wouldn't be data visualization without data. And statistic is basically the original kind of like German name for the science of uh, basically data that relate to the state. And statistic basically started as the science behind the domain of uh, information that the state had to process in order to be able to deliver policies around economics uh, and demographics. So what's interesting is that the kind of like science of data appeared at the intersection of the modern science of measurement, of which the picture at the bottom is a good representation, which is a painting called The Measurers, that was uh, painted uh, in the 16th century in the Flanders and represents this kind of like revolution of measurement where science was catching up with new ways of quantifying things and the modern state which is what I kind of like represented in the Leviathan cover of Thomas Hobbes uh, book The Leviathan and I think at the intersection of the modern state and the new science of measurements lies the beginning of the journey that we're now part of. Um, <coughs> I looked at an old book uh, from 1939 that was kind of like analyzing why uh, graphic methods of visualizing data had been really tardy in a way, but, but really slow in being adopted. And it was interesting to compare it to the situation we're in today. So they were saying that the, the, the reason why people had been slow in adopting visual ways of uh, dealing with data was that <coughs> actual data wasn't really um, available. Um, competent drafting talent to chart the data on a standardized basis was lacking, and equipment and organization for reproducing the charted data at a cost not too high compared to the printed world was actually completely not at hand. Now, all these three factors have been kind of like smashed by the big data revolution and by the fact that electronics and computers have made data visualization the ubiquitous interface that we, that we have today. Uh, but just to give you a bit of background on like, where data visualization as a journey has been, there is a really interesting uh, progression you can see here on what methods of data visualization that have been tackled, challenges that have been tackled over the centuries. And it's basically since the 17th centuries that we have been tackling uh, a number of different approaches to visualizing data from spatial organization to discrete comparisons to continuous distributions to multivariate distributions. And this is how far we come from. Um, I'm going to start from some of the pioneers that have been looking at this. And, and I think this is an amazing uh, sentence and also a scary one in terms of like the amount of implications that you have. Whatever can be expressed in numbers may be expressed by lines. And this is what we're dealing with today. Uh, but this is not the cause why we, we decided to visualize data. Uh, <coughs> there are 10 basic reasons that we found are uh, uh, kind of like at the, at, the, at the foundation of why we invest money in visualizing data. 
So, um, again, in that old book from 1939, there was this amazing page, which was just an introduction of the book, and uh, it was titled Magic in, Graph, in Graphs. And, and, and the first quote, I think, is quite enlightening. There is a magic in graphs. The profile of a curve reveals in a flash of all situation the life history of an epidemic, a panic, uh, or an era of prosperity. The curve informs the mind, awakens the imagination, and convinces. So in this sentence, for me, there is a lot of what we're going to go through in terms of these 10 reasons. But I want to explode it in like 10 different steps. So to start with, the first reasons why data visualization helps us is that data visualization is something that allows us to spatialize data, make it organized in a spatial way. By organizing in a spatial way, I mean disposing the information uh, around axes that we can use to correlate um, to in terms of uh, the body. So we navigate the world and we navigate knowledge through our experience of the body. And that's why we like data organized in a special way, because it allows us to deal with the data from a physical point of view. And that's why we find it extremely useful to deal with different data organized in a special way. Uh, <coughs> this is a really basic uh, extreme translation of that concept of tangibility and speciality uh, that visualizes the uh, statistics of deaths in Hackney in physical uh, in, in a physical chart that you can actually chart and, and navigate through. Um, another really um, crucial function of data visualization is objectifying abstract information. So this uh, visualization here is um, basically taking concepts and visualizing the connections of the concepts and how often those concepts come together. Uh, now, this is even more abstract than you can think of because this comes from um, a company called Weavers that designs clones. So they do basically social media robots that go around on the web and live as if they were behaving like normal human beings based on a profile that you design. What this does is showing us what kind of emotions they go through um, their life as robots, and now these emotions are connected to each other. And the green emotions are the ones that are cropping up, and the red ones are the core emotions. And the connections between the emotions visualizes how often those emotions are appearing together in the journey of these robots. So it's something extremely intangible that you, you can start seeing and touching by visualizing in this way. The, the, the second element, the third element, is actually uh, classifying and comparing data, entities, and distribution. Without data visualization, we wouldn't be able to uh, classify as easily as we do and compare as easily as we do the entities and the data that we're dealing with when we look at a data set. And a really basic arch diagram can allow us to look at entities such as nationalities, such as frequency of connections, such as number of reactions. And this visualizes the... Um, most influential people within a specific scene. This was a map that we did for the research industry, and we analyzed which um, uh, members of the research industry online were more engaging on Twitter. And this visualizes the, 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 the different nationalities of the different researchers, and the, each arch represents an amount of interaction that that researcher had with the other members of the scene. <coughs> um, Another key element of data visualization is that they allow us to deal with a vast amount of information at the same time. So we don't have to store all the information that we're looking at in our mind. We can just kind of like outsource that processing power to the paper or to the screen. Um, this idea of using an external memory is what Vygotsky, which is a cognitive sciences from Russia defined as an external scaffolding for the mind, and this is what data visualization does. It allows us to free the mind so that we can focus on, move seamlessly between focus reasoning and free associations. We don't have to remember the different variables that we're dealing with, the different data that, we, that we're trying to mine. We can simply hover between the different types of actions that our mind wants to do with the data, and we're kind of like freeing up processing power by outsourcing it to the visualization. Um, <coughs> Another key element that data visualization help us uh, nail is the ability to identify patterns and correlations. This is um, uh, a really basic visualization done for uh, Wired in Italy uh, by um, a designer that I don't remember. I will put in the uh, credits in the final presentation that we'll um, send out. Uh, is showing basically how many uh, users by country are using which social network. 
and and just the number of variables in this chart is just like uh, would be completely hard to grasp if it wasn't for this clear visualization and uses color shapes and sides uh, and, and, and a fairly like, limited amount of um, visual clues. Uh, but these uh, ability to identify patterns and correlation allows us to um, deal with uh, patterns and comparing shapes in a much better way than we would if we were dealing just with numbers. Um, the other key element that we imported in data visualization from computer science was basically the idea of uh, basically user interface design. It's this idea of direct object manipulation. The idea that you can simply point and click at a cluster or an entity or a group of data and manipulate that amount of data without having to, <coughs> without having to use numbers or natural language is also extremely powerful because it allows us to have a natural interaction with the data set. And these are the bottom is a, um, um, a, a graph of um, based on 60,000 followers of uh, the at O2 account on Twitter and in mind um, two millions of connections between those 60,000 followers within the data set and what it does is basically identifying clusters of users within an audience um, <coughs> so what we did is we wanted to map the audience of that brand online and we wanted to see whether there were some specific sub-clusters within the audience and on the bottom um, right corner you can see one of the clusters that were identified which was a cluster that was particularly into fashion. So what we did was mine a, a mutual connections between the different users in this audience and then analyzing the content that they were sharing on Twitter over one month, analyzing uh, three millions of tweets and almost like 150,000 a day. And, um, and by that we extracted topics and tags and these clusters are basically an aggregation of the clusters of users that are sharing similar topics. Again, the reason why we needed a graph to do this is that we could easily manipulate the visualization in order to show us either a cluster of users and all the topics associated to the cluster of users or we could click on a topic and visualize all the users associated to that specific topic. So we could completely reorientate the graph based on what the question was in terms of research. Uh, <coughs> the other key element that data, um, that diet object manipulation has, has, has introduced is this idea of continuous iteration this idea that we're not getting anymore into a data set with uh, a pre-formed hypothesis, but we're constantly mining potential hypotheses that are formed once we look at the data. So there are different, there are different ways of mining the data, but the main point that um, data visualization and big data allow us to do in, is exploring different hypotheses in a non-structured way, and some have been looking at this as a new epistemology, like is this a new way of generating knowledge because we're not going in with a kind of like preformatted hypothesis that we want to test. We're going in and we're looking at the data and we want to see if something emerges. So uh, in a way, this is almost like, um, I think a really good example for us in this case was when we were doing a tracking of, uh, when a couple of years ago, uh, Berkeley launched the cycle hire scheme. Um, <coughs> I guess the key point when you're tracking a campaign or a brand and when you're studying something that is happening uh, live right now is trying to understand what you don't know you don't know and trying because the things that you that you know you don't know are kind of like easy to tackle you can decide whether you want to tackle them or whether you don't want to tackle them but the things that you don't know you don't know are the most dangerous ones and social media and social data and big data in general interfaces that allow us to deal with big data have got a powerful potential in terms of allowing us to deal with emergence, things that we didn't know we didn't know. So in this case, for example, you can see this is a strata visualization of uh, <coughs> built in uh, D3 that shows how um, from the beginning of the campaign when the cycle hire scheme was launched, basically uh, people started calling, started referring to the scheme not as the Barclay bikes but as Boris bikes and no one was planning that and we were mining that. We were mining boys' bikes, we were mining uh, Barclays, we were mining cycle schemes. So this shows how these uh, patterns emerge over time in a really clear way and it's really easy to then go and mine it and find why it's happening. Uh, one of the final reasons why data visualization really helps um, dealing with, uh, with data in new ways is adding context. So um, the, one of the key points of good data visualization is that they allow us to 
uh, redefine the entire problem field and they give us an holistic view of what the problem field is. They're not giving us just the data. And by giving us the context of the data that we're looking at, they give us narratives. And when they give us narratives, they also uh, announce the engagement of the person that is looking at the, at the data set. So if you look at just a single data without knowing what the context is, you lose completely the engagement. But if you can build into that data set a narrative of where the data set is coming from and where it's going, then the engagement of the person that is looking at the data will be maximized. So in this sense, <coughs> there's a lot that can be learned from data visualization from, um, from game theory and game, and game design and trying to design data visualization that by showing context and showing narrative can be as immersive as a game. And um, this one here is a really simple one that shows uh, what this means. We were comparing the um, uh, mentions of the movie The Artist in relation to their nomination to the uh, Best Movie Oscar. And we were comparing that data to the daily gross of the movie at the box office, the odds that the bookmakers were putting out every day, and uh, sentiment and a number of other like metrics from social media. What is interesting, for example, is that we realized that there was a connection with this movie and all other movie in terms of um, correlation between the daily gross and social media mentions. There was always a spike in uh, box office data before a spike in social media data, but the opposite was never true. So <laughs> in a way, we realized that uh, a spike in social media mention wasn't generating or wasn't correlated to a spike in, uh, in, box of, in box office numbers, but the opposite was real. So that kind of like raises some questions in terms of influence and who's influencing who in terms of like is digital influence in face-to-face -face or is face-to-face -face influence in digital. And we found similar data in, uh, in other studies, for example, through mobile research that says that uh, people that, are more, that spend more time face-to-face -face are more likely to share the same apps on their mobile phones, which is a weird and interesting correlation. But anyway, and one of the final one is process, data visualization. We haven't done this amazing one, and you can't see. But basically, uh, what I can do is not only showing the structure of the data set, but showing through condensed dynamic images, they can show, um, they can represent time in spatial terms making sure that you can see how things evolve over time and, in, and making the transformative process available and visible and tangible for you to manipulate. Um, and finally, one of the reasons that really help us deal with the people that we're trying to convey information to, data visualization provides you tools to kind of like do it yourself and explore the data yourself and experience through your hands what that data set is telling you. And that's the most effective way of persuading someone that what you're telling them is actually true. I will close with uh, uh, a vision from uh, a futurist from the 70s that uh, came up with the idea of the microscope. He said, science has been uh, developing tools for dealing with the infinitely great, the telescope, we have developed tools to deal with the infinitely small, the microscope, and now we have to deal with something that is infinitely complex because of the structure society has developed, and now actually big data and data visualization is exactly in that, um, in that kind of like trend. And I think what's interesting is data visualization is one of the key parts of this new toolbox of the microscope, and it's what is probably going to allow us to stay afloat in this sea of data. That's it. Thanks.